use this medium during this time to uh, connect with uh, friends in the theater community and uh, see what's happening and uh, talk about uh, what we do when we're not uh, social distancing. Uh, we have uh, Matt Cahoon of Theater Kapow. Uh, we have Gary Locke of, and I'm not even going to try, uh, Balux. <laughs> Baluxera. Yeah, that's right. Productions. And uh, Brian Halperin, uh, who are calling uh, a wandering director. Okay, I had itinerant, but uh, he, he changes to wandering. Okay. <laughs> um, all gentlemen who have been uh, done a lot of theater and directing in uh, our area, neck of the woods, as they say. Um, and so I think it's be, uh, it will be very interesting to hear the, you know, their perspective and what they've done. Uh, and why they do it, uh, which is actually where I want to start, um, is uh, to talk about just briefly, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your origin story and how you gained the, uh, the superpowers of directing and, and, and why you direct. Uh, what, what, what draws you to this medium of uh, theater and this, uh, this, this endeavor? Uh, and uh, whoever wants to jump in. Okay, I'll go. Um, so, you know, like a lot of people in theater, you know, I started out acting as a kid and being interested in acting and wanting to be an actor like so many people do. And as I got older, and that seemed less uh, realistic and um, started doing some directing in college and then some directing community theater after college. And then uh, my journey took me to New Hampshire to start a theater where I ended up by default doing a ton of directing. Um, because there were only a few of us running the theater and uh, realizing that I was a way better director than I was an actor and, um, and finding I enjoyed it more too. Um, not that I don't enjoy acting anymore and I still do it occasionally, but um, you know, it, just, it just sort of evolved into uh, a, a career of, of sort of out of necessity. Um, I started out as an exec the executive director of the theater, but ended up doing half of the directing uh, uh, um, of all the levels that we did. And uh, just found that that's where my skill set uh, lied that was most uh, enjoyable to me, but also that I thought I did the, did the best at and went on from there. So now yeah. I only act on occasion. Yeah, so I just follow up. So, I mean, we all do something once and decide, yeah, that's not for me or you know, whatever, but obviously you've all done this and you decided, oh, I like this. And, so I just just curious, what what's the one thing or a couple of things that you find so compelling about that keeps you coming back and, and doing it? Well, I mean, I think you know it's a leadership position, and I think if you like um, if you like being a leader, you like collaborating, but you also like being able to sort of being able to give the big picture your spin and, and have some control over that. And, um, you know, and ultimately any, any part of theater is telling stories. And I think the, the idea of being uh, the one who sort of gets final say on shaping the story and using a lot of different skill sets. I mean, we'll probably get into this, but you know, I, I taught a directing workshop once and my idea was, you know, actually like directing theater is like a small percentage of directing. You're a cheerleader, you're a psychologist, you're a a coach, you know, uh, all these different aspects of, you, you know, in working with people in anything you're doing, theater or any other job. So there's a lot of just, a lot of ways to use different skill sets. And that's what I found, um, you know, why that sort of ended up being the track that I focused on. Cause I liked worrying about more than just, you know, myself and what I was doing on stage. I liked worrying about the big picture and having a, a more active role in shaping the story. Nice, nice. Uh, Matt, why don't we jump to you next? Sure. Um, so the origin story is that I was an Andy Summer Playhouse kid. I was there for seven years of my youth um, and um, was directed by really, really amazing professional directors from New York. The artistic director at the time was Dan Harlan. Um, I was there with Christine Lindsay, who went on to be married to David Lindsay Abair. Um, it was just a really, it was a kind of golden time for Andes. There were a lot of people there doing a lot of different stuff and I was exposed to it from a very young age. So 
Um, I, uh, I went to college and much like, you know, I, I was an actor. I mean, my story sounds a lot like Brian's, I'll be honest, but uh, I was a director in college. There, you know, there are a lot of student directing opportunities. So I did that in, in college. And um, my first job out of college was as the production manager, technical director at the palace in Manchester. And, um, and I did tech theater there for five years before moving to Pinkerton where I am now is uh, running the Stockbridge. And um, in 2008, we, we formed Theater Kapow. And, um, and yeah, you know, I was doing some performing, but a lot of directing because, because like Brian said, it was kind of the necessity. We needed somebody to direct shows. And, um, and it became, I, I think Theater Kapow is a little different in a couple ways that we're an ensemble company with with a, um, a company of actors that perform with us regularly. And so I really consider my role as, as an objective outside eye in the rehearsal process. Um, my, any of us, all, all three of us would agree that uh, our collaborators tend to make directors look good. Um, and so if you work with good actors, work good designers, good stage managers, um, you know, you, you end up looking pretty good. Um, and I think that uh, you know, kind of like Brian said, there's something about being the driver of the vision of a piece that's very appealing. And um, and with my company, we really are um, we're really asking and trying to answer very difficult questions about the human experience. And I I find that uh, I find that edifying in its own way, whether or not I was a theater director. Um, and so I think that that's why I keep coming back. I keep coming back to scripts and um, and seeing or exploring the human experience and uh, and there's no end to it, right? It's bottomless. And so that's that's what keeps me coming back. Good, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to mention to um, those who may not be familiar, there is a chat. Uh, and if you have questions and you wanna just throw them in the chat, uh, that's a great place to kind of just put them in there and I'll uh, ask Andrew uh, to uh, kind of monitor those and uh, we'll get to those at some point here uh, as we uh, go through the evening. Uh, but going on to uh, Mr. Locke. Yeah, thanks. Um, actually, my story is a little bit different. Um, I, I started in theater as a kid. Uh, uh, my sister was a uh, was someone who had a lot of friends, and those friends wanted to work at the Guilford Playhouse, sometimes known as the Lakes Region Playhouse, and it did switch back and forth. And my parents thought it was a great idea um, uh, to get me out of the house with her. So I was 13 just old enough to um, have some kind of a very part-time job. And so I went along with her. She didn't stick around very long as an usher. I couldn't get enough of it. I thought it was a fascinating world uh, with, um, you know, beautiful women taking their clothes off and, and all kinds of, of amazing stars uh, from television who there was something called a hiatus season at that time for most television networks. And so they, um, they went on hiatus and, uh, uh, and I met some really very cool and amazing people and I just couldn't get enough of it. And I stayed. And uh, that was 1969, so that was uh, 51 years ago. June will be my 51st year uh, working in and on and around stages, so it's really cool. Um, I decided it, was, it wasn't It was until the, the uh, 1989, I think, when I directed my first play. I considered myself a, a, an actor first. And uh, I wanted to do something very different and uh, wanted to extend myself artistically. I did not study theater really in college. I studied Shakespeare 
so I was out. I was, I was looking for something to do, and uh, community theater was my place to start um, uh, getting some exercise intellectually. And that's it in a nutshell. If if I was to say anything about theater, it's that it uh, and directing in particular. It's just it's the most intellectually stimulating thing that I can imagine that I've ever done. And I'd rather uh, do that than anything just because it's so fascinating. Um, and I keep coming back to it because there's so much, there's so much material and there are so many very interesting uh, pieces of work out there. Phylloxera Productions is all about taking existing work or existing material, one sort or another, and putting a fresh spin on it. And that's what I do. Great. So uh, I want to kind of really dig into um, what, what, a, what a director does. Um, and obviously it starts with finding a script uh, or being presented a script, uh, producing, uh, I think, uh, well, Matt, you, you have your own company and Gary, you seem to you know, be producing your things. Brian, I imagine things are kind of brought to you and said, would you be interested in directing this? Um, Starting with the script, how do, what's the, how does that beginning process start to work as you read through the script and you start thinking about it? And uh, obviously this then leads to casting and rehearsals and all, all sorts of things we'll get into. Uh, but I just want to start, you know, kind of the, the entry point uh, where, where that, uh, what interests you and what, uh, what gets you hooked on uh, wanting to produce, uh, direct something. Well, I'll start there. Um, I, uh, I'm always looking for something that I haven't quite done before. Um, there have been a couple of occasions where I've uh, directed shows that I was in that I just particularly liked and thought, you know, now it's, now it's my turn to see what I can do with it. But for the most part, I will, um, I'll open up a script, I'll read it, and it has to, um, first, I have to feel as though I'm right for it. You know, I, I may find many plays that I really like, but I'll say to myself, well, I'm, I'm not right for that material. Somebody else should be doing something about the African-American experience or somebody else should be doing something about the LGBT community. I, you know, I'm, I should not be doing that. But at the same time, I will sit there and, and read a play and it will it, it just blow me away uh, beyond my expectations. And here's the key. Every time I decide to do a show, <clears throat> I find a scene, a, a, a moment in it that I, I see it in my head. I know exactly how it should look like on a stage. And then I'm done. I'm like, okay, not only do I love this, but I know one moment already where I can visualize it. And that changes everything for me. Then I have to figure out how I'm going to do the rest of it, you know. Uh, I think venue is very important. Uh, I, you know, you need, to, you need to select a show for the place where it's going to be performed. And, and if you get that wrong, you can screw up terribly. Um, so uh, those, are, those are very, very important factors. But, but more than anything else, uh, I just want to look for something that tickles me. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot that Gary said that I can respond to. I mean, for, 
And it's really hard because we get asked all the time, like, how do we pick shows? And it and it um, so often is like something that's hard to define. It's a little bit um, of an un, of an intangible um, for us. And we, you know, when we read scripts, we'll frequently say to each other, you know, this is a very theater kapow show, and we just know what that means because we have a a, a shared vocabulary over time. But I think what what Gary talked about in terms of the narrowing process is important. You know, we. In, in my company, we're putting a show on a, on a company of actors, so suitability does matter. Um, what Gary said, I think, is also really important. If you look at the Pulitzer Prize winners for the last, I don't know, 20 years, many of them are dealing with um, the Arab American, American experience, or the African American experience, or, um, or, or just a, somewhere, something that I don't feel comfortable uh, representing myself as the director and, and also that we have a challenge of as much as I'd love to you know to present that work there's a challenge of the availability of actors in that in those communities and so that's a that's a part of the process of narrowing down to a script um, but it also is um, and I you know Gary put it better than I could but there's there's the finding that moment and seeing it in your head that's super important I I remember um, directing Miss Julie, which was Theater Kapow's first show, and I, I could see what her dress looked like, right? So I, I had a very good idea, and I woke up and I said to my wife, who was doing costumes, like, she's wearing a green dress in the scene, this is what it looks like. And lucky for me that my wife was able to then build that thing. And I did get to go and, and direct that show a second time at Winnie P, and it was a very different experience. Um, but I think the vision piece is super important. Like if you feel like that show rests nicely in your, um, in your comfort zone, but it's also something that's going to really stretch you as an artist, something that's gonna demand a lot of you. Um, we talk a lot about filling buckets. Does the show, you know, are we better off picking a, an easy show and overfilling a small bucket, or are we better off picking up a, a big bucket show and only half filling it? And almost all the time, we'd rather half fill a, bu a big bucket show, right? We wanna start with great dramatic literature. And if, if we don't get it completely right, that's better than starting with bad dramatic literature and knocking it out of the park, in my opinion. Um, so, so yeah, that the show selection process, and for us too, it's very much a communal process. Um, unless I'm unless I'm hired to direct, you know, occasionally, um, you know, I've directed at Winnie P and at Jeans, and they'll they'll come to me with a show and say, "This is the show we want you to direct." Um, and and it is interesting. Another thing that Gary said is the show's suitable for you because I, you know, selfishly I often feel a lot of shows are suitable for me, but I have had artistic directors say to me. I just don't have a show for you this season. And I don't know what that, I often don't know what that means. It's like, okay. Um, but, you know, I think I, I think I'm pretty flexible as, the, as a director, but, um, but need to sometimes be reminded of my own limitations, I guess. Um, for me, I think it's a couple things. I mean, there's really two sides of it. There's my own intellectual and artistic stimulation. And there's, you know, the, it's a storytelling part. Nobody wants to tell a story to an empty room. Um, at least I don't. Uh, you know, part of doing this is to share it with an audience. So, um, you know, I think both of those things factor in. Is that do I get something out of this as a director that it sparks my interest, that it's worth my time, that it's something I could be excited about? And also, am I going to do it in a void, or am I going to do it to uh, you know uh, people where whoever's putting up the money for it, it, it'll be you know worth it to them that they've done it. Is it beneficial to the organization? Um, but you know, selfishly as a director, especially now that I'm, you know, sort of an itinerant director, um, you know, I'm going to go to places where it's a show that I'm interested in doing. Um, if I'm not excited about it, why put in the time? It's a lot of time and effort. Um, and I know I'm, you know, the shows that I've done best have always been the shows that I've been most passionate and excited about. And why have I been most passionate and excited about? Because there were story, those were the stories that I had felt I had something to add to the material and it's a message or a, or a, or a, or a story that I needed to share with an audience. Um, you know, I think most good directors know that, you know, should, should be perceptive enough to know that not every show is as great as every other show. Um, and a lot of that I think stems from 
your connection to the material and then your ability to communicate that not only to your production team and cast, but then to bring that all together in a way that it speaks to the audience. Um, you know, so, you know, back when I worked full time at a theater, there were a lot more considerations on putting a season together and how does that fit? And, you know, I like Neil Simon comedies as much as the next guy and I've done many of them and I, I think I do them well, but they certainly don't, you know, necessarily excite me as, as something like Amelia, which I did at the Hatbox, um, which was much bigger challenge to me and that, you know, um, touch the audience in a much stronger way than, you know, the average Neil Simon comedy is going to. Um, so, and I, you know, so I could have fun doing a Neil Simon comedy. I could be inspired doing a piece that I, is more interesting or more challenging to me. And I think that comes through in how it presents itself to an audience. Well, that's a good question. Uh, how much of your uh, decisions, it sounds like you, know, you prefer, you know, things that are, challenging and not necessarily crowd folk, crowd pleasers um do any of you feel like you you, you uh bring the audience you know what the draw audience draw is going to be in your uh, decision making um i mean certainly if, if you're running a theater you have to because you're thinking about budgets and how that's going to fit into allowing you to do the next show and you know when you're going from community players to uh, concrete community players to Hatbox to Jeans Playhouse or whoever, you know, you want to be involved in something that's good for the venue. I mean, if uh, if you would do a good job and the venue does well or the company does well, there's more likely to, for them to come back to you and want you to do something another time. Um, you know, I don't think I've ever done, I ever pitched a show to a company saying, I really want to do this show. You're going to put up the money. It's going to suck for you because nobody's going to come see it. But I'll feel good about doing it. So, you know, let me do it. Um, and I art, think art, uh, artistic success, but not a, uh, yeah. yeah and, and, you know, sometimes there's a group that can do that once in a while and are, are, are you know, excited about your vision enough that they want to go for that ride, even though it's maybe a risk to them. But I mean, I don't think anyone wants to do a show that's going to, you know, sink a, uh, sink a company or, you know, you know, empty their bank accounts and, and give them no chance to return. That'd be pretty selfish. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's generally true, but I'll, I'll tell you that we're probably the outliers on that, you know, um, and I, I think what Brian said is important about not wanting to perform in the void, but um, in full disclosure, Don Tung used to be on my board of trustees, so he could probably tell you some of this, but we, we generally actually um, are budgeting our shows knowing that the ticket sales aren't going to bring them, aren't going to make them whole, right? So, um, the, the funding for our shows comes from sources outside of actually quite a bit outside of ticket sales. And that's, I'm really proud of the fact that we've never, I don't think we've ever picked a show knowing that it was going to sell tickets. We've always been able to pick the shows we want to do, um, and, and kind of stay true to ourselves artistically without having to pull a an Annie out of the hat or something to do to keep the company going. But we also don't have, um, really importantly, we don't have the responsibility of overhead of staff or venue, which changes the equation entirely for people. So um, it's really easy to be high-minded when, you, when you're nomadic as a theater company. Um, and that also reminds me of something Gary said, which is place is super, super important. And, um, and I don't think I've staged I don't think I've staged many shows in the same audience configuration. It, it, we change the audience configuration almost every show, is what I want to say. And I, it's rare that it's like, we're going to do proscenium two shows. It, it, it's going to be traverse, it's going to be in the L, it's going to be in the round, it's going to be something different every time. And we, we look for venues that allow us the opportunity to really flex the staging uh, on a show by show basis. I will say that every time I go to a Kapow show at the Opera House in Derry, I'm, I'm always anxious to see exactly how have they staged it this time. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Yeah, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to pitch a show to Hackmatack or to uh, Milford area players, the same show that I would pitch to say the Players Ring or to Hatbox. At the same time, I want to make sure that 
if I did something for its artistic merit at Hatbox that I thought was, you know, very important, but probably not going to draw an audience. The next time I pitch a show to Hatbox, I want to pitch something that I think is going to bring in the audience. And, and uh, that's, that's important. So that they'll say, well, okay, we'll, you know, we'll give them this if he'll give us this. And, and, uh, and, and, and that's worked well for me over the years. All right. Um, so once you've got a script or you've been given the script and asked to direct something, now you've got to cast it. Um, and I'm just curious, what's your process as far as casting? Um, finding the, uh, the personnel to uh, fill the characters. I mean, I, I won't speak for everyone, but I think, you know, all three of us have been around the area a decent enough time. And, you know, Matt's got his repertory company. And, you know, so I think we all have people who worked with us before that, you know, if they had a good experience, we'll come out again. But, you know, casting, I, Matt said earlier, casting is really everything. Um, you, could, you could be the best director of the world. If you have the worst cast, you might have an okay show because you elevated them, but you're not going to have a great show. And uh, you could be, a, you know, I'm sure not, nobody on this panel, but I'm sure everyone has seen shows where, you know, you've heard from the cast that the director was a nightmare, didn't do anything, but the show came out great because they had good actors. So, you know, right. casting. So, you know. so, so let me jump in there. So when you're reading the script, going back to the script, do you always sort of have a, a general idea of people in the community that you think can do the parts? Um, uh, no, I mean, like for me, it would be not a case pre of, Not pre-casting, but you know that there, there's, you know. Yeah, I mean, like they were saying before, uh, you know, you need to know that there are people out there who could do this if, if you could get them to come out. Right. Um, right. You know, we it, it's the longest running, you know, non-joke in New Hampshire community theater history, but you're not gonna see any you know, you're not gonna see Scotts, Scottsboro boys on a New Hampshire community theater stage anytime soon. It's just not really possible. So, I mean, that, at that level, I think, yes, you have to keep in mind, is it, if your pool of actors is all 50 somethings and you wanna do a show that ha, you know, needs a bunch of 20 something, uh, you know, why, why, pitch, why do that show if you can't cast it? So, that, yeah, not necessarily specific people, but knowing the demographic is out there, who you would need to get to come out if to make it successful. I mean, one just quick example, we, To Kill a Mockingbird, I directed for the Winnie Players a while back. And, you know, it was really, really hard to cast the African-American roles. And we almost couldn't do the show and, until Bruce Smith uh, came out of the woodwork and was willing to make the drive up and, uh, and, and fill Tom Robinson. But we took a risk putting it on the season, knowing that, it was going to be hard to cast Calpurnia and Tom and Tom's father and, and the Reverend. And it was, it was a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think for, uh, as Brian said, we all have a pretty good understanding of who's out there. And so occasionally I read a script and I'm, and there's a character and I, I'm like, I know who I need to ask to do this show. Like I, there's, you know, it, we do audition, um, we don't audition every year, but we do audition some years. Um, and so I don't want to say we precast shows, but there's a lot of times where I'll read a script. I've got like two or three right now, like in my brain that I'm like, I, I need this actor for this part. Um, that happened last year with, um, uh, with Pride and Prejudice for us. We like, we needed Rich Hurley to play Mary Bennett like really badly. Um, and, and I said that to him almost, almost right away. I was like, we want to do Pride and Prejudice, but we want to make, have you play Mary Bennett. And, um, and that's, that's how the casting worked. But the, absolutely, the casting is, I mean, like, if you get the casting right, you're in, just in really, really good shape out of the blocks. And, um, and I, it was funny, you know, I was thinking this, this afternoon before this about the New Hampshire Theater Awards, and, and I, you know, has there ever been a director that won Best Director without that show winning anything else? And I think Brian would probably tell you the answer's got to be no, right? Because, you know, the directors, it's hard to recognize a director in a vacuum uh, if everything else isn't, isn't also working. So, um, 
So all of you out there in the community tend to make us look good. Oh, to be sure. Yeah, my, my, my philosophy is to um, ask the person I most want first. And um, there have been times when I've been shocked that that person said yes, because I didn't think that person would say yes, but I really wanted that person. And uh, okay, so I'm good. From that point on, I've got a fulcrum on which everything else can spin. Uh, there was the case of the maids where I had wanted to direct that show for years. And I had a conversation with Constance Whitman and she said, well, isn't that funny because uh, Whitney Smith and I have been wanting to, to do it for years. Now, let me, let me emphasize, not as long as I wanted to do it, but that's neither here nor there. And uh, I went, well, now, <laughs> I think we've got something. And I needed to, to have one more person in the cast, and I was very lucky to get Nancy Pearson in it from that point on. I mean, okay, I can't lose. I cannot lose. And that was golden. Great moment. So when you're, again, I think it always keeps going back to the script, as you're, and Matt said, you know, he saw Miss Julie in a green dress, you know, so you obviously get visions of these characters in your head. Um, how much does that play into casting when you may not get somebody who, who seems like the, the vision that you had, but seems like they could really do the part well? I mean, have you had a situation where you, you've kind of like gone against yourself maybe and, um, and said, you know, I really think this person, I, I didn't really see that as a, an option, but you go ahead with it anyway. Oh, I can, I can remember one, this is a long time ago, but I can remember one time when I was uh, uh, directing Rumors and Neil Simon's Rumors and there's a cop in that show who is nearing retirement. And I, I wanted this to be a very physical part. I had all kinds of ideas for it. And I couldn't find anybody except for this guy who had just graduated college, who had no hair. He was bald, completely bald. And I thought, I might be able to do something here. And I dressed him in a policeman's uniform that was way too big for him and I made it and he looked older as a result and I got everything I wanted out of it including this poor guy jumping up and down on a on a sofa uh, to the point where he almost hit a few lights um, and it, it, you know it worked it was it was absolutely golden but I could not have done that in a in a intimate setting like the player's ring, where you're right on top of that guy and you know that that person, but, but in, a, uh, in a larger proscenium stage, oh yeah, it worked. Yeah, I, 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 Don, one example I would give was a show that you were in for me, but uh, when we did Tony Kushner's The Illusion, um, uh, we needed this Matamor character and I had gone to the Manchester Public Library and um, Sebastian Lockwood is not an actor, um, but is a storyteller. And he was telling the Odyssey. And he just was this huge, bigger than life guy telling the Odyssey. And I, and I approached him and said, I really, I have this part, this crazy part in this play. And he agreed to do it. And it was not, um, it was certainly not the way I imagined it, you know, that he came and played this, this part. And the other thing I'll say that happens a lot more than I think all of us would like is that sometimes people are, you cast somebody and they drop out and you have to replace them. 
And so I, I directed um, Buried Child, which was a, like a dream show for me. And Gail Angelis was supposed to play um, Hallie. And, um, and she, she ended up not being able to do it. And then so we got Mary Keegan to do it. And, um, and it ended up being this amazing, Mary is, is from outside of Chicago. So she ended up with this, you know, the perfect Midwestern accent. And it was a, they're very different actresses um, and would have inhabited the role very differently. But, um, and I, I thought it worked really well. It was, a, it was a happy accident in a way to have to make that, that change in course. I don't have anything too much to add to that because I don't think my, uh, you know, both of them said they had this notion of they get, you know, visions of a particular moment or thing. I don't think when I read a play, I get that specific. I think my, my attraction to a play is more overarching um, and thus I'm not necessarily looking for somebody for specific at auditions. Um, you know, uh, the only only show I've ever done, uh, any the only community theater show I've ever done in New Hampshire, where I precast was uh, Amelia, um, and that was just waiting for the right two actors that I thought could handle the piece because it was just a really hard piece, uh, particularly the male role. Um, but um, I so I think for most community theater productions, I'm I'm holding auditions anyway. I think I'm waiting to be pleasantly surprised and see who comes out and and work there. I mean. I'm definitely the type of director who, even though I have a really, you know, anyone who's worked with me will tell you, I have a real clear vision of what I want to accomplish with a piece and how we're going to go about it. Um, but, you know, most of the minutia thing moments come from watching, I mean, seeing what the cast does naturally and say, oh yeah, I got an idea based on that. So, so I, don't, I just, you know, it's just a different experience. I don't, I don't think casting wise for me works quite the same way. It almost um, sounds but again, like you're, you're keying more into the story and and then who you find to tell that story. You're kind yeah, of and I, I think both of, both of Matt and Gary both do, you know, they're, they're, they're doing their own companies. They have their own pool of people they pull from regularly. So they're more selecting based on who's part of their rotation and um, a part of their pool. Whereas if I'm doing a show at Hatbox or Community Players of Concord, uh, you know, it's an open audition and I have no idea who's going to show up. So why you know, why streamline myself to a, a vision that doesn't walk through the door and then I'm stuck versus seeing who I get. And I think, you know, that's where I think if you're a good director, you work, you're able to work with who you got and, and find a way to take what they bring to the table and make it work to fit into your overall vision. Um, I always, I, I view directing theater a lot like, so you think you can dance, you know, the best to me, always the best routines of so you think you can dance are the ones where the, um, the choreographer comes in essentially as a director and says, this is the story we're telling in this dance. These are the characters you're playing. Those are always way more interesting to me than the ones where here are the moves you're doing and you're gonna be in this kind of costume. Um, so I think it's the same kind of thing. You, know, you're, you work with the pool you have and, and shape their talents in the best way to tell that story. Um, interesting. I have to say, you know, for those that know me, I'm, playwright and boy I always have visions of my characters and what and how they look and talk and move and so I find that very interesting that you you don't tend to have that strong pull until you really got your cast pulled out. Well as a playwright it's a different story I think. Well um, I, I yeah but you know I, I think I my, my playwriting then kind of bleeds over into my when I ever direct so <laughs> goes in that fills in there too. Um, we have some questions. Uh You're muted, Don. Nope. Don, you're muted. I can't look at the chat and unmute myself with the space bar. That's the problem. Okay. So, um, Pam says, do any of you ever come to the point in the production where you realize you're going down the wrong path and need to start over? Um, I, not, not with the, old, the piece as a whole. I've had like 
I've gotten to a point where like an actor's just been doing it a certain way and I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And then it, you know, it's just not working and finally I understand why and, you know, have to talk to that actor about, can we try this instead or let's make some adjustments there. In terms of the piece as a whole, I mean, oftentimes you're working in such a, you know, particularly if you're doing summer stock or something, you're working such a, a finite time frame. you really have to have a concrete idea going in and then, and then plow through. You don't necessarily have the time to explore and try things and scrap it. So I'm usually pretty prepared with the shows I'm doing. So I don't, I don't think as the piece as a whole, I've ever said, this isn't working. We got to start over. I, I don't, I can't think of ever that happening. I tend to be more concerned with the, uh, sometimes with technical things not working right. Uh, and discovering that uh, we don't have the wherewithal to create um, a set the way I, I wanted to, or um, we have to rework how we're going to, uh, how we're going to transition scenes, that sort of thing. Sometimes that can create a little bit of um, anxiety, but not with the show not with the cast that has that has never happened and so i have to i have to work behind the scenes with crew sometimes yeah i mean i would say we i mean what what brian said in a way we don't we don't ever scrap the whole thing um but we do have a philosophy that um you know the rehearsal room is full of a thousand failures and and often so much is learned from that failing moment so um, you know, we, I, th I think we try, I think we have to try every moment, whatever that is, 600 different ways to find the one that worked best. And so there is a lot of scrapping, editing, going back, figuring it out. And I have had, um, you know, to, to Gary's point, I have had a, a few times where we had staged a show with certain rules in mind in terms of the set and then we get there and I realize it just it's not working the way I want to and so we've made set changes or or furniture changes and then have to restage stuff that happens pretty pretty regularly I would think um but Brian Brian's also right I've worked in that 10-day rehearsal process and and it's it's a lot trickier um uh you know your set design is approved sometimes months before you start rehearsing. So, um, and by the time you're into day one of rehearsal, the, the crew is building that set. So there's not a lot of time to go back and start editing stuff in, in that setting. Um, but I would say that at Winnie, um, I think one of the things the actors at Winnie like about working with me is that we do explore quite a bit. Um, they get to, tap back into what it was like to be theater majors and we play theater games and do things and um uh they they seem to enjoy that after the kind of the rigors of being in a summer stock schedule all summer interesting uh yeah he's putting my space bar uh we have a question just for matt actually from mary uh which comes first for kapow uh selecting the plays for the season and then creating the theme or establishing the theme and then finding the plays to fit it. Thanks, Mary. Um, I, think it, I think there's two, uh, it depends entirely. Sometimes there's a play that we know we wanna do and it doesn't fit into a season, so we push it to a future season and then it becomes the anchor around which we build a theme. Um, all of our seasons are themed, um, which I guess is, is in Mary's question, but I should clarify. So Theater Kapow has a theme season every year. Um, this season, for example, our, our 12th season was, um, the theme was That's What She Said. It was all female playwrights. So that was the only kind of unifying um, thematic thread. Um, but what we do do every year, and we have done, we're going into the 13th season, is we created in year one a formula, which sounds really restrictive when I, when I explain it to people, but is tremendously freeing to us when we pick shows, which is that we do a, um, a non-American piece, either European, Canadian, Australian, um, in our fall slot, we do a comedy in our winter slot, and then we do an American classic, often now contemporary, but an American playwright in our spring slot. And we do that every year, 
and every other year we um, we feature a, an original piece in June. So um, when we have that uh, framework to pour a season into, um, we then build up a, a supply of scripts we're looking at, and then we we really as artists um, have conversations about themes we're interested in exploring. So. Um, you know, there's a lot going in our heads right now in terms of what themes we might want to look at next year coming out of the, the pandemic. But, um, you know, I think it's it's a conversation back and forth. Sometimes we land on the theme and we go find the show. Sometimes we've got the show and we let that theme blow out. Um, so the season we did Buried Childs was American Dream, which is a weird thing for Buried Child. But, um, you know, we had, was Dream actually. And we did it, uh, we did The Illusion and Buried Child in the same season. One is very much about dreams, one is about the broken American dream. Um, so there's a little bit of flexibility with that, with the theming of a season. Okay. So um, getting back to, you know, just kind of uh, following the, the process here, as it were, the, the script, the casting, uh, and then you get into rehearsing. Uh, you've got your cast, you've got your script. Um, how do you work the, you know, do you do a table read? Do you do t a lot of table work, uh, blocking? What, what, what's your process in, in getting it from, uh, from page to stage? Is this I, do a, uh, I do a table read. Um, and more importantly to me, and probably the most important thing to me, is blocking as quickly as possible. I will block. Uh, a show in two or at the most three sessions. I think we did the Scottish play in, in two rehearsals. Um, I, I want to do that because as an actor, I know that it's important to me to know where I'm standing, who I'm looking at, am I downstage left, am I upstage, right, you know, wherever, um, so that I can get that in my head. That means that going into every rehearsal, from rehearsal one, I have written down every piece of blocking in the script. I have, I have put it in my head, and from the head, I put it down onto the paper. I don't care why you moved from point A to point B. I just know that's the picture that I want. And then later in the rehearsal period, we will work that out. And if in the blocking rehearsal, I've screwed up somewhere, I can see it right away. I can make those adjustments and we can keep moving on. So that's the most important thing to me. One of the reasons why Copenhagen has gotten as far as it has uh, and is ready to go is because we blocked it into sessions long before we got into uh, the lockdown. So we were able to do other rehearsals uh, before uh, we had to go and do rehearsals online. So anyway, that's the most important thing to me. Yes, I'll do a read through. I want to hear them say it. I want them to hear everybody else saying it. But more important than anything else, right away, I want to do that, uh, that blocking and we'll do it in two or three sessions at the most. Now you said you do start with a table read. So, so what do you get out of the table? Read? What, what, what's your your motivation. Of you know, that. sometimes it's more what they're going to get out of the table read. Okay. It's, it's meeting everybody else and hearing those voices and, and getting, although I will say this, certainly one of the things that you do is you'll establish, for instance, this is how this name or this character or this word is pronounced. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to, you know, they're not going to go a few weeks uh, thinking that it's pronounced one way when it's pronounced another way. You solve those problems right away. Uh, but more than anything else, I'm, yes, I want to hear it, but I want them 
to have that communal experience uh, before we get any further so that they they get a sense of this is who I'm playing off of and and this so is where of, their approach a bonding, a bonding moment yeah very much so I think this may be the question where Matt Gary and I my answers differ the most um, but I, I would say I, I do a table read and immediately followed by discussion I want to hear what the actors think this plays about and I want to tell them what I think it's about and I want to make sure we're on the same page of that. I think uh, so much about, you know, telling a story, communicating a vision is making sure everyone on the team is working toward that same vision and, and that same story. Um, so every play to me uh, is some sort of intellectual exercise of, you know, it's a puzzle that needs to be unwrapped and some puzzles are a lot more complicated than others. Um, after the initial discussions, most of my discussion comes in the context of rehearsals. I'm not big on exercises and improvisation, uh, but I am big on discussion, but in the context of the scene work, what's happening now. Uh, and unlike what Gary said, I absolutely want to know it, why you're moving from A to B if you're going to move, um, what's the point of that? Uh, but interestingly, I don't pre, -pre block anything. Um, I have some ideas of the overall style I want to, you know, go for and where maybe some entrances and exits might be, but I find most of the most interesting and most natural blocking comes out of seeing what the actors do on their own the first time. And that goes back to how good your actors are. Actors who know how to move on stage and have motivated movements are going to block the show for you. Um, and, but more importantly, I th I've always found most of the most exciting and interesting and funniest physical things come out of either a mistake or somebody doing something accidentally that ends up working perfectly. Um, so I don't have a single mark on my script except maybe a, a note or two about a word or here's a, a thing to emphasize. Um, I use the first, you know, couple weeks of rehearsals to explore the scenes at a pace that works you know, that the actors are capable of and seeing what br they bring to the table. Cause um, you know, I think that's the exciting part of that collaborating with actors is not just telling them go here, go there, um, seeing why they would go here or there and what that looks like. And them going there might be way better than if I told them to go here. So that's just my, my feeling on it. And, uh, and, but discussion I think is very important. Always, always checking in with the actor to make sure what their motivation or what their instinct is character-wise matches what you, th you think for the character. And I have this thing, I almost always can tell when an actor isn't sure of what they're saying um, because it's so obvious in the delivery that they're saying a line, not, you know, not, not making a choice or, or presenting an idea. They're reciting a line. I'm like, I, especially when I, I also work at the Interlake schools and, you know, this isn't just with kids, but particularly with kids, you know, I'll stop and be like, what do you mean by that? I don't know. I was like, I know you don't know because I can tell from the way you're saying it, you were just, you're just saying it, you have no idea. Let's talk about it and right. see if we can help you understand, you know, why you're saying that. Right. So that's my two cents on the rehearsal process. I have to say, you, when, you, when you talk about your process, it reminds me of the story of, uh, I heard of um, Clint Eastwood, uh, who also said, you know, he just, you know, casts good people. Uh, and his whole directing thing was, just to sit, sit there and say action. Well, I don't think I'm as humble as Clint Eastwood because I don't <laughs> think that's all I do by any means. But I know, but 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 you're but you're feeling out. You're you're letting the actors see what comes naturally, uh, and then giving them a chance to have an input onto their character and their movement, and uh -huh. it still needs to match my overall vision and fit with what I'm doing. Right. But if if what they're doing doesn't fit, we need to have a conversation and understand why. But, and but get on the same page. So that's you, why I think you, discussion right, is so you, important. You, right. You've layered that with discussion, getting on the same page, and now, you know, letting them, you know, see what comes naturally and molding that uh, yeah. into what... Uh, yeah, I think it's... Um, this is the beauty of this conversation to me, is these three perspectives, because I think Brian's right. This is the one place where we're probably... Um, well, that everyone's process should be slightly different, I, I would hope. Um, you know, I am very much, I, I also do not enter a rehearsal process with any marks in my script, um, but I'll say certainly what, what Theater Kapow does that's probably a little bit different than most is that usually there's an element of training in our, in our work. 
So we we did the Penelope ad this fall, and I I had trained with uh, Tectonic Theater Company last summer, and so we we created that piece through their method of theater creation called Moment Work, which really meant that um, for the first couple weeks of rehearsal, if not the first three or four weeks of rehearsal, we didn't touch the script. Um, we were we were working on um, a process of devising moments of um, theatrical poetry and then we were coming back to the script and um, now that's not to say I have we, we often start with a read through um, and then go away from the script and then come back to it um, you know when we did when we did stupid effing bird I'll keep this family friendly um, we we did our read through on our feet. I, um, to set up our read through, I set up six chairs on one side of the room and six chairs on the other side of the room. The actors came in and chose a side. We did the read through on, this, on their feet. And then that read through actually um, influenced the staging of the piece. Um, we had no off stage when we got to performance. There were six chairs on one side, six chairs on the other, and they performed in the space in between just as we had done in that first read through. So um, I think to what Brian said, I am, uh, as a director, I, I lean on the actors a great deal. So much so that I've had actors say, you know, it'd be great if there was a door here. And I'm like, all right, fine, there's a door there now. You know, like we, I, I, that input is so critically important to me um, for so many reasons. So, so it really starts from Acorn in that first rehearsal and it grows. But I will say to, to what Gary said, I work, I block very quickly. Um, and we always talk about building the skeleton and then throwing flesh on it afterwards. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll build that skeleton, we'll train for four weeks, we'll build that skeleton in three days and then we'll flesh it out um, until we get to, to production. Um, and that, you know, it has worked pretty well so far. Yeah, just following up on that, uh, the, the, it's not two days, but definitely the initial blocking is to get a framework that's going to be built upon later. And that's, you, that's usually, what, you know, same idea, I would just, you know, maybe use a different choice of words. But, um, you know, the notion being, as Gary said, blocking helps actors learn lines, and, uh, you know, it gives them a, a grounded point to enhance it. But, you know, so... So I know some directors will stay on the same moment again and again and again, you know, the first time they're doing it until they get it a certain way. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about get, roughing something in that feels good, that if we had to go on stage with that blocking, it'd be fine, but I'm sure we'll make tweaks and changes as we get more into the characters and, and uh, you know, and know the piece better. And I'll add that uh, making sure uh, from the get-go, and that's at the table read and, and uh, every subsequent uh, rehearsal, that uh, everybody understands what the vision is, what the purpose is, where we're going with this, uh, so that they're comfortable and don't get blindsided by something, um, and also feel as though they're in the hands of somebody who knows what they want and and their job is to uh is to make that that vision come true and collaborate with me uh as that process goes forward great well we are at the top of the hour it's been a great hour of discussion uh we got some wonderful questions when we come back and uh some more uh we'll talk about uh working with designers and uh that process. Uh, so looking forward to that. And uh, we'll probably be back at, let's see, it's 8.01. Uh, we'll probably start up again about 8.10. So let me take a break and uh, we'll be right back. Thanks. Please feel free to keep adding questions to the chat during the break if you'd like. So. All right, 8.10, we are back. Nice little break. Uh, so I want to get to a couple more questions here. Uh, 
have. Um, ben asks, do you have any advice for pitching a show to producers who have not seen uh, your work before? And so I'm guessing as a, as a new director or somebody who hasn't done a lot of directing, uh, trying to um, encourage producers to uh, hire them as a director, uh, any advice on? Well, Ben, hey buddy, how you doing? Um, I hate to break it to you, but it's really, really tough. Um, as somebody who's been on both sides of it, um, back when I was running a theater, people wanted to direct for us all the time. And, you know, it's really hard to entrust somebody else to be a roving person if you haven't seen their work or have some sort of relationship with them. Uh, you know, as important as, ever, as all the other jobs are, I think the, a bad director can do the most damage. Um, so if it's your company, it's hard to, it's hard to trust. So when I, when I started my itinerant journey, I ended up being on the other side of the table. Um, you know, I had won professional New Hampshire theater awards and for five years until, uh, Joel hired me at jeans last year, I couldn't get a summer job at, at, at a summer stock. Um, and it's just, the reality is people have their own people and unless there you develop some sort of relationship that maybe in some other way or they're desperate and they need it and they have a hole to fill and they come to you but it's really tough um and the community theater scene ironically is just as hard uh, you know uh i had a you know i had a pitch and uh, when i first wanted to do something in community players of concord there was a, a process and i had to be approved and you know i directed like 40 shows in 10 years uh you know, or more even, it, and, uh, you know, and I still had to go go through the ringer uh, to get, get a foot in the door. So I wish I could tell you it was an easy process, but uh, the reality is it's just not, at least, at least not in New Hampshire from my experience. Well, I think, I think you have to make sure that they know that your, uh, what your vision is. Um, I think you have to let them know that you love it. I think you have to let them know why it's right for um, for their venue, um, and you have to do it in a very short period of time. So you need to work on that pitch like it is um, a monologue that you are going to perform in front of. Uh, uh, the the most important scouts in the world, you know. That's that's what it's about. Yeah. You know, sorry, sorry. Gary. No, go ahead. Uh, I was to say this is where a place like Hatbox can I think can come in very valuably to somebody like you who's trying to have an opportunity to show your work because you can put together your own team, make your own pitch, and get a chance to show your work in New Hampshire. Um, and beyond, beyond just getting people to see your work, that's how you start making the relationships with actors, with designers, um, things like that. So I think I'll, I'll, you know, I'll tout Hatbox's uh, way of doing business as a, probably an opportunity you should think about pursuing because it's a lot easier for a new director to put their own team together and, and get a shot at having a, a slot there than it would be you know, actor singers or community players conquered or some other group that does three shows a year and they have directors that have already been, you know, vetted and proven or Matt who, you know, doesn't want, uh, directs almost everything at his company. So, uh, you know, he's not looking for people. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree with Brian. I think the players ring and the, and the hat box are, uh, there are a lot of pop-up productions, right? So do the work you want to do. I think that's the most important thing. Um, it's, it's really rare that you're the perfect match with a company, um, you know, and, and there are times I've, what I wanted to direct at Winnie and so I would go to Neil and ask if I could direct and ask if I could direct and eventually he trusted me with a show and then another show and another show and another show. But I had to, I had to have cut my teeth with Peter Capow before he was gonna give me the, the reins to a production there because to Brian's point, you know, that's their business. So you put that, you put the steering wheel in the hands of the wrong person and, and then suddenly that, that company could be in real trouble. So um, start small, do your own work, um, pitch something at the hat box, at the player's ring, 
uh, get a group of friends together, put on a show. It's like a old fashioned tale, but I think it is true to an extent, you know, Theta Kapow started with four friends from St. Anselm College. We started in our living room. We did uh, Strindberg's Miss Julie, which is a three person cast. Uh, three of the four of us were in the cast and I directed it. Um, and that's how the company started. And, and I think that's probably the story of a number of companies is doing the work, telling the stories you feel like you need to tell and finding somebody willing to give you the space to tell them. Yeah, I'm just curious, and you come across the, uh, the role of a, of a uh, assistant directors. You don't see that a whole lot, but do you find any places that use assistant directors as sort of almost a uh, training ground for directors? I, uh, I've done it. Yeah. Yeah, had, had an assistant director for your- Yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't done it in a while uh, because my, Stage managers tend to be more my assistants now, uh, but yes, in the past I, I have done that, and uh, and those people have gone on to do other things. So yeah, yeah, I had an assistant director for the Penelope ad, and um, and it was a play that had a choreographer too, so it was really like two. You know, I actually we actually listed Lorraine, my choreographer, as a co-director because she was creating so much staging. But then we had an assistant director who um, was really an important part of the process, and so much so that, like, you know, a lot of her input um, became reality on stage. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd also like to add that <laughs> one of the reasons that I I don't use assistant directors is much as I used to is because um, every assistant director also has to get paid mm -hmm. and uh, you start to look at how you're going to divide those checks and checks, yeah. so. I, I, I'm I going along the lines of when somebody asked me if they could be the assistant director, I, you know, I'd be like, I don't know what an assistant director really does personally. Uh, I think if somebody wants to learn and watch and be involved in rehearsals and offer an opinion, um, you know, but I, as I think Gary said, you know, oftentimes a director looks to their stage manager to fill a lot of that extra set of eyes or run an idea by. Um, so it would almost be more like a co-stage manager and assistant stage manager than an assistant director, unless you're prepared as a director to say, you take this scene and have at it. Otherwise, to me, it's a watching and maybe raising your hand once in a while and having an opinion. You know, if that's, I, I've, I've had situations where people have wanted to do that with me because they want to learn or they want to be a part of it. And I'm not opposed to it. But I go into it saying, I don't know what you will actually do. If sitting there and may, you know, offer and being another pair of eyes and offering an, a, a thought now and then is appealing to you, great. But if you think I'm gonna say block the scene or, or I'm giving this act to you, you know, I'm probably not gonna do that because my name's on it as the director. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, Ina has a good question that kind of leads into our next uh, area of discussion uh, about designers and working with production teams. Uh, she asks, how do you communicate your ideas for a product to your production team, actors and producing theater company? Um, and I would extend that she didn't have designers in there um, but as you have your vision uh, of how this is all going to uh, be realized on stage, um, how much, I'm curious, how much in, uh, in communicating, uh, is it a communication of this is what I want and can you help me realize it? Or is it a, uh, gee, I'm not sure how I want the lighting or this to look, and can you help me figure it out? Is, is curious. Um, I think it's a combination of both and a lot of it depends on the player musical you're doing and who you're working with. Um, you know, I, it, just going back to the early part of the question is, you know, how do you just, you know, describe your vision? I mean, you use your words, you know, you, you, if, if you can relate, if you can relate eloquently your vision to your design team, you know, you're going to use the same conversation, the same words as you're going to, uh, related to your cast as well. 
Um, so, you know, that's where the communication skill set of a director is really important. You could have the best vision in the world, but if you can't put it into words that other people can follow, if it only exists in your head and you can't communicate it, you're not going to get very far. Um, you know, from there, it's a question of getting input from your designers into how to make that uh, be realized. And sometimes it might be very specific. I want something like this, go put it into 3D and figure out the colors. Or other times it might be, you know, you're doing a show that's a box set and, you know, it's a, of a certain era. And in that one, you're going to just let the director go do their research on what, you know, what does a New York apartment building for Barefoot in the Park look like? What does the script require? Okay, it needs a skylight that snow can come in. It needs this amount of many doors. You know, as a director, you don't need to micromanage how, how that gets laid out. That's where your, you know, your set designer is going to br bring their talents to. But if it's a show where you're conceptualizing, then obviously you need to feed that concept to them before they can go out and figure out what the physical world might be like. You know, this is a question I think Matt's got advantages of because he's a, I don't know about Gary, but, you know, Matt's got a very strong technical theater background. So he probably has uh, a different set of tools that he can rely on and communicate with his designers. But for me, it's about, you know, the overall feel and vision uh, of what, what we're trying to do and, and what, the, what the setting is. Because a lot of plays and musicals don't have a setting, you know, it's, in, it's up to your interpretation. So how you're going to make that interpretation is going to affect the physical world of the play. And I'll shut up and Matt can elaborate. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we, um, every time I, well, actually, when we pick a season, one of the first things Carrie does, my wife does, is creates a Pinterest board for each show. So we have vision boards pretty early on. And um, like oftentimes before we know who's designing even, we will have a, we'll have kind of an idea of, the vision of the show. I, I in, a, in a weird way, um, and this is maybe a controversial statement, but I, I, I think that we have a, a kind of defined aesthetic. And when you see a still picture of a show that I directed, you could say like, oh, that looks like a Theater Kapow show. And I don't exactly know what that means all the time. Um, but some of the things we do are, um, is we set specific design challenges for our designers. So I've worked, I think, tremendously highly of Teva Young, who's done every lighting design for me for almost seven or eight years now. Um, and she's brilliant. But we like to set challenges to each other. So I'll say to Teva, like, we're gonna do this whole season under natural light and I don't wanna see any instruments. I don't wanna see, and she just has a lot of fun with that. Or I'll say, to scenically, um, you know, in the season that we did the illusion, every set, um, Don will remember this, but every set had uh, had to have three circles and a bare light bulb. And so then um, the designers have a lot of fun uh, tracking that vision for the season kind of through the whole season. Um, and we we do that type of stuff a lot, but I mean, images in our Pinterest boards can be anything. They can be from dance, they could be from film, they could just be environmental shots or landscapes. And, um, and we pour them all in there. And one of the first things we do with designers is give them access to that Pinterest board and table will just go crazy adding stuff and adding stuff and adding stuff. Um, and then by the time I get to the show, she and I are so in sync now that it's there might be a moment where I say, hey, I really want like a down spot, a tight down spot on this person at this time. Um, but beyond that, I let her work, you know, because we, we are so in sync that I don't need to really, I don't really need to step on her feet in terms of, of what she's going to do lighting wise. Um, and I do speak the language of the designers, which is super helpful. Um, the designers I work with at Winnie are, are artists, very much so. Um, and they really appreciate when they have directors who can kind of speak their language. Um, and in that setting, um, I, I almost always start with scenic. Um, both, both Brian and I have worked with Dan Daly, but Dan will actually, um, uh, he'll storyboard out scene by scene for you sometimes. And there's just a lot, like the collaborative process between the, the designer and the director is, uh, I mean, tremendously important. If I'm the director for hire, 
then I'm going into a company which has its team and I'll lay out my plans, but I also trust the team and we communicate constantly. That's vital. In my own productions, then I've laid out the vision and I'm working with somebody and I'm going to be much more precise and tell them it has to look like this and I will do a lot of the work. Um, but I've been surprised. There have been times when I've worked with um, uh, oh, Gina Bowker, for example, who's someone that I've worked with a lot and and I, she and I, because we've worked just like, just like Matt was saying, you know, when you've worked with somebody so much, you have a, um, you have a shorthand when you're talking uh, to each other and they, and they get it. And there have been times when Gina's like, wow, that's really good. I had no idea that's what you were going for. Um, it was my vision, but she, she brought it up a notch and uh, she's not the only one who does it, but, but Gina and I work very, very well together. I, I call her my work wife and uh, that's, uh, you know, it's worked very well. Yeah, I would, I would also just add, to, you know, to Brian's point that I've worked professionally on the other side. So I was a, I was a um, uh, summer stock lighting designer and a summer stock stage manager. Um, and so obviously I think that that helps, but the other thing that it helps with is um, I was doing a show, I won't mention the theater, um, and, and I was designing the lights for it and we had worked and worked and worked and it was one of those situations where I only got dark time at about one o'clock in the morning and um, the director came in the next day and said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I never like amber lights in my show. And so I had to go then cut all the ambers and I was like, I hope I never do that to a designer, right? So like, um, you know, that it's the collaborative, that's the word, you know, you have to collaborate and not be so stuck in your idea of what is, what is um, right or wrong. I'm curious, uh, obviously you spend majority of your time uh, rehearsing, I would think. Uh, Percentage-wise, what do you think is the percentage of rehearsing versus uh, production designing uh, work? Um, any ideas of what how that would break how that breaks down? Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I uh, for the most part, the design begins before the rehearsal process but you've got to be in communication with your lighting designer, your set designer um, for, you know, a couple of times a week, just, you know, okay. how's it going? Do you have some questions? Mm -hmm. You know, are there problems? What do we need to, to address? So you're, uh, you're checking in fairly regularly. Oh yeah. 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 Even, even if it's only, you know, 15 minutes here and 15 minutes there uh, because it, it's so, you know, it can screw you up, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden you've, you, everything you think is going smoothly. And then somebody says, you know, I have absolutely no idea how to make rocks. You know? <laughs> right. Right. So you're, you're basically just, yeah. Uh, checking in, making sure progress is, is, is absolutely. Progressing. Yeah. Yeah, when you when you've got your own company, I mean, you know, we did time stand still and I I said we have to do something every day. We have to go get a new prop, we have to paint a wall, we have to go get some furniture. We're craigslisting constantly. Um, you know, so in that setting, the tech was just I still look back at that and don't know how we had the time to do it. Um, so there it, it depends a little bit on the show, but um, it can be, and it, get, it depends on your role, you know, like um, 
uh, in that I was directing that show and we were in rehearsal three or four days a week, but every other day was Craigslisting, painting, you know, going and getting set pieces. And it, it just, that's what life is if you're producing your own work. Uh, let's see, another question, just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody here. Okay, so I think uh, Pam has another question. Uh, how much leeway do you allow an actor to go off on their own uh, tangent? Well, there's a reason they call these things plays. So let them play. You may not like it, but you know, it's like, as long as they've not completely gone off the rails mm -hmm. with with what you've already discussed but if they want to take this ah, you know i want to try something here um you have to mm -hmm. have, have fun this is what it's all about having fun so by all means do it yeah, I mean, I think if what they're doing is working and they're, you know, coming up with it themselves, it has nothing to do with what you had in, in your mind to begin with, but it works, then you just go with it. If it doesn't work, like that example I gave earlier, um, the guy ended up winning a Supporting Actor Award, but I don't think he would have if he, I had let him keep going on the way he was going with it. Um, so, you, you know, I, I, it's all in the context of does it work and does it fit the piece as a whole? Um, it's no... I don't think any of us have a big enough ego that we say, well, we didn't think of that. So I don't want you doing it that way if what they're doing is working. Um, you know, I will say earlier in my career, I, I always go back to this one example. Very, the first couple of years of, 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 in my summer stock career, I was doing Sylvia. And there was one scene where the actor, who was an older actor playing uh, um, the, the, the male lead. And there was one scene that he played really angry. And... Angry was a reasonable choice, and it wasn't the choice that I had in my head of what the choice should be making, and I thought it'd be a lot, be a lot more interesting if he played it hurt rather than angry, but I didn't have it in my vocabulary or my confidence as a director to say, can we not try angry and let's try hurt? And like, that was, I, I was really happy with how that show came out, but that scene like always haunted me. And years later, I got to do Sylvia again, totally different cast, and this time I made sure that we weren't gonna play that scene angry. And I do think it worked better and I think it would have worked better the first time. Um, so that's one of the few ex examples I could think of where I let an actor go a certain way and then regretted it afterwards that I didn't speak up. Yeah, for, for us, this can be a real challenge because we, um, you know, I'll use their names, but my, my wife Carrie is, has studied in practical aesthetics, and we work with Peter Josephson a lot, who studies in Chekhov, um, and Peter, Peter or Carrie, you know, the, the actor's process is, is often, um, they're, in, they're, they're in different places than the director is. So, um, you know, Peter is, is working on something um, that maybe I'm not fully understanding, but I'm letting him work through that process because I have a certain amount of faith that he's gonna come back to the ground eventually sometimes literally, um, and, and but, but there does come a moment, right? There does come a moment where um, we need to be, we need to move on, we need to get to work, we need to do whatever it is. And, and sometimes it is something, you know, Gary said early on, I have said to, um, to Peter, I'll call him out by name, you know, like, I don't need you to know why you're moving that stool in this moment. I need the stool off stage before the next scene can start. So, you know, we'll figure out your motivation for why that stool's moving later, but let's move on, get the stool off stage and then and block the next scene. So um, some of it is that leadership role of, of knowing when to step in and say like, we, we need to reel this in at this time. Um, one thing to just add on top of that, which I think is, it's something we haven't talked about at all, but I think is a really important part of directing is, um, you know, Matt just gave examples of two actors he worked with regularly who have different approaches and, um, you know, and sort of their own ways of doing things. But so much of being a director is playing, you know, sociologists, psychologists shrink and understanding that every actor comes at it differently or has a different, you know, 
might have had a tough day at work and understanding that these are people with emotions and instincts and their own insecurities and you know some actors like to get really pushed and some actors get really defensive and you the way you're going to coax out a better performance out of those two you know respective types of people means handling them differently and i think directors fail when they can't recognize that you know every person they're working with and not just actors but production team too all have their own buttons that you can push in the right or wrong ways and um you know i think people will want to work with you again when you push their buttons correctly and not when you're when you're when you're not so it's really on you to be um you know have the ability to understand that each person you're dealing with production team or actor works a little differently has different sensitivities has different defense mechanisms and to get the best your job as a director is to get the best out of all these people and if you can't treat them all the same somebody's going to go home crying and, and the other person's going to go home cursing you and the other person's going to go home loving you because you nurtured them and it's you know it, it's all about personalities and i think we didn't say it in the beginning, but I think to me, that's one of the things I love about the, these collaborations because I like people and I like working with people and finding a way to help bring out the best talents of people by learning who they are and what they're good at and how, you know, what makes them tick is, a, is a, to me, a huge, usually important and usually valuable part of directing. Make absolutely sure that your cast knows, each and every member of your cast knows that you respect them. That's vitally important. And, and, and you make it clear every single night. And that will go a long way. All right. I've got some great questions here from people who haven't had a chance to ask questions that uh, I want to try and get to many as easy as you can. Uh, Andrew asked, which kind of goes back to our talk about designers. Um, can you describe um, what you look for when seeking and cultivating collaborators? And maybe not just designers, but collaborators in general um, that you uh, work with. How do you um, cultivate that uh, relationship? Um, well, so you, for me, want? I work with a lot of people regularly that I hear from other people that they don't like to work with and they will say to me, how do you deal with them? And um, my philosophy has always been, if they bring more positive, you know, let, let's face it, there's a complicated world of theater practitioners in the state of New Hampshire. Um, there are a lot of very wonderful people and a lot of very difficult people and a lot of people with all sorts of degrees of baggage and um, I always value, my answer is always because they bring more positives than negatives and I can deal with the, the I, I can deal with the negatives because their, their positives outweigh them. Now, yes, obviously you always wanna work with people that don't have any negatives um, and that you, you, know, you treasure those relationships with, like Matt and Gary were saying, people you're on the same page with, you know aren't gonna bring extra drama um, but the reality is there are only so many of those people and you, you cultivate relationships with enough of those people and you do the best you can with the others. And if, if their contributions are valuable and important, yet maybe personality wise, they rub people the wrong way or a little tougher to deal with or, you know, late in hitting deadlines, you know, that's when you just choose whether the, the pros outweigh the cons. And, and I've always found if, if I find the pros outweigh the cons, I can I can deal with it, and the minute that that changes, then I wouldn't want to work with those people anymore. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, I love working with artists who who look forward to the challenge, and so, um, you know, when I go to somebody and I'm like, we we want to put an '80s cover band on stage, and they're like, whoa, that's awesome! Like, how can I, you know, like, what can we do to help? Um, and I also love, love, love collaborating with people who are willing to, um, to, to not be siloed. So um, very often in our training process, like for the Penelope ad, my music director would come and train, would move, would create, 
work. He wasn't in the play, but he was somebody who was, who had a vested interest in the success of the piece and was willing to go outside of his given role in the show. And, um, and that's true of, of almost everybody that collaborates with Dieter Kapow. They're, they're not wearing one hat, almost, I mean, almost nobody wears one hat. Um, and if they're willing to play for the benefit of the show, then those are people I want to work with. Yeah, I, I want to have, I'll recognize someone who's got a good nature and has imagination. Um, but sometimes it takes a while to find that as well as um, just somebody who's always there. You know, you, you, you arrive at the theater and that person is there either right behind you or got there just before you were. Uh, that, that tells you a lot. So I'm, it takes a while. You don't do that uh, immediately. Uh, but, uh, but in time, you will, um, you'll just find that when you have an opportunity to work with that person again, you jump at it. Uh, Lowell uh, brings up a question that uh, I kind of, I think it uh, kind of posed earlier. Uh, in thinking about uh, well, even starting with Tech Week and then once the show starts running, he asks, do you give notes after opening night or let your cast go on their own? Uh, and I think that's always kind of a, an interesting question. Do you, how, how much do you feel you, you let go or do you let go? Oh, I hate giving notes after, after we've gone up. We should have done it right the first time and that should be that. And if I have to give notes, there's a big problem. I do remember one time when I could hear backstage the actors talking about, you know, I want to do this tonight and I want to, I want to try this tonight. And, and I, I'm like, is that what we did for the first show? Because I don't remember that. And more importantly, there are times when you worry about safety because somebody's going to try something that they've haven't done before, or, or they're going off in another direction. And uh, that's, now that's gotta, you, you've gotta nip that in the bud right away. And finally, I do remember one time when an actor was so convinced that what he was doing was funny. And it wasn't because he was beating a joke to death. And I, told him, if you do that again tonight, when I'm in the audience, I'm firing you and I'll play the part. And he didn't. And that was that. Um, for me, this is a depends on the situation kind of thing. Like a lot of summer stocks treat the first few performances as previews. I mean, it's the first chance you have to see how a, an audience is reacting to things. And you know, that impacts how you might tweak things. Um, you know, when I used to be at the Playhouse, the first three performances, we had everyone joining for notes after that, uh, after, the, after the show, and we treated them like previews. Um, with community theater, it's generally a little different. I, I, I don't think I've ever had a, okay, we're sitting down and having notes session after a, a community theater show opens. But I'm also a believer in you know, people want to make the best show. And if something's going wrong and you see a way to fix it, I'm not afraid to go up to an actor and say, you just did this a little differently. Or, you know, I thought of something tonight. This is why this beat hasn't been working. This'll, this is what's going to make the laugh harder. Why wouldn't you give that note and try and get the better laugh the next night? So um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a rule one way or the other. It's situational. Uh, um, but, you know, a three weekend, you know, a three show, one weekend run of a community theater production. Gosh, why, you know, if there's a, a tweak or two you can make from opening night to the second night that's going to make it better, you know, why wouldn't you want to make it better? Um, and again, I think some of it's going back to knowing your actors too. You have to know whether the actor who you're going to give that note to is one, 
good is not going to throw them off or confuse them or make it worse and that they're receptive to oh yeah if i can make it better i want to be better um so I, I have no hard and fast rule on that it really depends on the situation and sometimes honestly it's just inspiration you're watching opening night you get a brilliant idea that you missed because of the way the audience reacted to something you know if it's a short run and you only get a few chances to do it right why not try to do it better yeah i mean i i would echo so much of what Brian just said, but I mean, for me, it does, I would say nine times out of 10 notes that come after opening night are because actors have come to me and asked, you know, they've said, what did this work, blah, blah, blah. And they, they know that I was there. Um, the, the summer stock or extended run world is a little bit different for multiple reasons. For one, the, the reason that Brian mentioned, and the other is that um, opening night might be the last time you see the show um, for, a, you know, I try to come back mid run. So I've come back mid run and seen choices made by the actors that, um, I was like, why did we do that? That is not what we had originally staged. Um, you know, that's only happened once and it was in a three week run. So there was a, there was a lot of time between uh, when I left and, and when I came back to see it. So, um, but it is very much on a case by case basis. I would say with Theater Kapow, uh, you know, the actors will ask me after a show, like, did this moment work? We'll talk about why did it get a laugh tonight and not why it didn't it get a laugh last night and um, stuff like that happens all the time, but not a, not a formal, everyone sit down, grab your journals, we're gonna do notes. Right. Typical, uh, you know, tech week kind of uh, note giving. Um, we'll ask another one. Uh, David Mamet said, just say the words. How much do you think the director affects actor performance? Well, I think when David Mamet gets, you know, Alec Baldwin and Jack Lemmon and stuff to say his words, it's, you know, <laughs> easier you know, it's easier to make a statement like that when you're working with, you know, you know, brilliant award-winning actors every, every time. Um, you know, I, I think absolutely a director could have an impact. It all goes back to what we said earlier as to how good your actors are. If you have great actors, they won't, they don't need you as much. They maybe just need sort of an overarching, uh, you know, set out, like I think Matt called it an impartial set of, uh, of eyes. But uh, you know, I, I work with from fifth graders up to up to professional actors and, um, you know, obviously there's different levels of guidance that people need and that, and again, it's no one size fits all, but of course a, a director can make an impact on, on getting a better performance out of an actor. So I guess I will say I disagree with David Mann. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, just to expound on something Brian just said, it, it's going to depend on the actor too. You know, I, um, I'm, I'm friendly with Estelle Parsons and she will often tell stories about when she works with actors, right. Or with directors right now, they're afraid to direct her, um, that they try to just like, Oh, you, Estelle, you do your thing. And she really, really objects to that. You know, she still wants to be directed. She's still, she's 93 years old. She still feels like there's stuff that she can learn in the process. So, um, so yeah, I think David Mamet might be wrong about that. Uh, I, on the other hand, I would say that I never consider my role as a director, Brian's, Brian's um, example maybe being the exception if you're working with kids, but I never consider my role as a director as being an acting coach or an acting teacher, um, unless I'm working with high schoolers or younger. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna try to teach my company members how to act, but I am gonna direct them. Um, and I think that, through direction, they can they can put on um, better performances. Yeah, totally agree in every respect. Yeah, David Mamet's wrong. <laughs> right. I had an interesting situation actually. It was during the illusion uh, where I had an, a a fellow actor uh, come to me with a suggestion, an act, a a direction, as it were. Uh, and it actually turned out to be just what I needed because uh, I just wasn't giving the other person what they needed in the scene. Uh, and of course, they were the ones 
feeling it and knew what I needed to give them. How much do you dig into, you know, having your actors talk about, you know, the, uh, what they're feeling and how they're, how the, the scene is working for them or not working for them? Uh, oh, I, 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 I ask all the time. Yeah. So that all the time. Every, time. every night, uh, uh, multiple times, uh, I, I ask and, uh, and I want them to be completely open with me mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, I can say, okay, so here's, here's what I think we need to do or whatever. Yeah. Because the they're, actors that, yeah, they, they're in the moment and they know what's, what the dynamic is. Uh, and so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> To redeem, to redeem David Mamet for a moment, uh, he also <laughs> says the test is in the other person, right? So the, the, the test of your character is often in the, in the actor playing opposite you. So as a director, it's hard to know if that relationship is working right, if it's landing correctly. So I think that there is, there has to be that space you know, again, there are exceptions to this. The worst thing probably Brian would tell you is like a, a young know-it-all actor who's gonna try to boss everybody else on the stage around. Um, but if there's that, that relationship and atmosphere of respect, I think that, um, that yeah, it, it's totally appropriate for, a, direct, for a, a fellow actor to say, this moment isn't just, it's not quite working right. And I think we should work through it and try to figure yeah, it out. Yeah, there are three words that uh, as a director, I will, uh, in after a conversation with the cast, I will say, let's try this. And it may not be anything that we've done before, but if it moves this in the direction that the actor, that makes the actors more comfortable or puts them on the right path, um, then I want to do that again. That's why they're called plays. You just keep playing until you get it. Let's see. Uh, Ina asks, honey, have any of you directed musicals or any form of theater that is not just a straight play? What was the process like? So I guess the, the, the well, I guess I'll take this because I don't know about Gary, but I, Matt doesn't generally do musicals. I mean, I do musicals, you know, at least as often, if not more often than plays. Um, and sorry, what was the question? <laughs> so, yeah, what's, it, what's different between directing a straight play uh, versus a musical? Well, so the interesting thing about directing a musical versus a play is obviously, um, you know, I think sometimes in a musical, and it really, it really depends on the musical, but oftentimes in a musical, the director is much more setting a vision for the overarching piece. I mean, you know, there are some musicals that are all sung through and danced through. Um, and, you know, in a, in a musical like that, obviously you have two additional collaborators you don't generally have in a play, the choreographer and the music director, um, you know, who, who are responsible for their avenues of it. So, you might say, well, you know, what does a director do even if, uh, if everything is sung through and danced through? And that's where I think, you know, the director's job is more about um, collaborating with those two people to make sure all three of you are working toward the same vision. And, you know, I've never met a situation where the, you know, the choreographer, the music director has, has taken over the rehearsal room and said, this is, you know, this is the, this is how we're telling this story. Um, but oftentimes in a musical, the director's more about shaping the, the you know, the feel of the piece, um, particularly if it's not a, you know, a traditional book musical that is, you know, straightforward. You might be having to come up with the concept and creating the world that the musical is in. I, you know, I, I use, because I did it most recently, but um, Fantastics, the Fantastics, which I've done twice now, um, you know, the director has a lot of, a lot of leeway in, in providing a framework for how that story is being told, because that's a storytelling theater piece. Um, you know, story, I, I, people will laugh, certain people will laugh when I say this, but most people who know me know I'm often attracted to storytelling theater, play or musical. And that's just because I feel like that's a chance for me to shine and get to put my own, own stamp on something because the piece is begging for the director to put their own uh, stamp on it. Um, but uh, 
you know, much of what you do in a musical is the same. It's just some of the context of what you're doing it in is with working within the songs and within the dances, but it's still the same goal of telling the story. You're just having additional elements to it you might not have in a play. Right, I, I love directing musicals. Um, the biggest difference for me is that you've got two other collaborators, the choreographer and the music director, who know their business better than you're going to. And uh, a healthy relationship with them uh, and, uh, and a, good, uh, 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 a good working relationship anyway with them is, is vital. And I love, uh, but I love doing them. Um, and I did, I think I may have been known more for musicals in the 90s than I was for, for straight plays, which is strange, but um, yeah. And every once in a while, I'll still do one. Yeah, I, I will say that, yeah, you definitely can have that tug of war of the, the music director wanting more time to rehearse music, the choreographer wanting more time. You know, so it's always yeah, a, a juggling match. Um, oh, there, there's definitely that element of you're not the only one leading rehearsals. Right. Um, and, you know, but you are sort of maybe the overall buck stops here person, in which case, it's really your job to find them the time they need. I often find, you know, my time of, you know, blocking a scene or working on character stuff, you know, takes a back seat because I want to make sure the music director and the choreographer get the time they need. And some of that is my own confidence in myself that, okay, I, I, I you know, I'll be the one who squeezed for time because I'm confident I can get my, my part of it, my piece of it done. And if it's going to make them feel better about it and more confident in their part of it, I give up the time to them. So, you know, they're collaborators in the same way all the, you know, designers on a play would be. Um, they're just more in the, you know, have a bigger role in the rehearsal room than maybe a lighting designer or a sound designer or a set designer might. Well, we are winding down here. This has been a uh, fascinating two hours. We have one uh, very interesting question from Mary. Uh, let's see if we can squeeze in here uh, in the last uh, few minutes. Uh, have any of you restaged a show from the from your past simply because technology has evolved to the point that you can better realize your original vision? And on the opposite viewpoint, do you have a show that was such a bad experience for you? Well, this is kind of getting to something else. So let's just take the first one. Um, it's rather interesting. Uh, a show where you, you did it once, but then technology evolved and you realized, oh gosh, I can do it so much better now that I have. It wasn't, a, it wasn't so much technology, but Theta Kapow started with Miss Julie and then um, 10 years later, uh, Neil asked me to direct Miss Julie at Winnie P. And so what, what was very different was the budget suddenly. So I had, you know, I had designers and stage management and um, and professional actors and everything was was different. I love the play so much and I love both productions, um, but it was extremely interesting to it's the with the exception of the Antigone. It's the only show I think I've done twice. Um, and it was really interesting to jump back into it 10 years after having done it the first time. Uh, I have done some things more than once, um, and I think I, I think that's a great and really interesting question. And I think that might be something in the next few years that is people you know have an answer to more and more. Um, you know, the the things I've done on repeat were not for that reason because I thought I could do them better or different. Uh, they just you know came up in the rotation again, or the opportunity provided itself. But you know, I do think you know the reality is in New Hampshire. Um, you know, it's not like reinventing a Broadway show now versus 20 years ago with what they could do with projections and lights and stuff that, that they couldn't do. You know, the reality is mostly in New Hampshire, we're still not doing, you know, those kinds of laser light, proje multiple projector things and things like that. So maybe, you know, maybe as the cost of those things come down and, and the expertise for doing those things, um, you know, Andy with Jared Mizaki, Mizaki has, you know, a leg up on that from everybody else. But I think that's a really neat question. And I think it, going down the road, I think that might be something you see more of. 
Yeah, I could see myself doing that. The only time I've restaged a show that I had directed, and I keep thinking of one or two others that I'd like to do, it was um, Invasion from Mars, and I twisted myself into a pretzel to do it almost exactly the same way I had done it uh, at the Players' Ring, uh, and and because it worked, uh, and I liked the I liked the results the first time, so I wanted to repeat it. All right, one last question. We are you know, out of time here, but uh, quickly uh, from each of you. Uh, Amy asks, what's your most important advice for someone wanting to start out who hasn't directed before? What's your sage advice for somebody wanting to? Find a out? project you absolutely love. Find a project that you can't imagine anybody else doing better than you can and make it happen. Um, I think I'd say have patience. I think directing is really something that you can't study all that well. You kind of just have to do it. And so the first time out, you're going to do it and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to learn from it. And, um, you know, I, I think directing is absolutely something that you get better at over time the more you do it. Um, so, you know, Give yourself permission to take that first plunge and put your best effort into it and not expect, uh, you know, a Tony Award um, that you probably won't be a master at it from the start. I'm sure Gary, Matt, and I will, would you know, will agree. And, you know, I feel like I get better every time and I learn something new every time. And it's, it, you know, what, what, once you stop, once you get to a point where you don't think you can be a better director, you're probably going to get be a not very good director from that point on. Yeah, I would say two things. One, I really think it's important to read and read everything, whether that's plays or fiction or nonfiction. I just, I, I find the process of reading really, really important to me as a director. And I think the other thing is, um, uh, is to know a little bit of everything. You know, if, if any theme has kind of emerged tonight, it's, it's, you know, we started with acting, how we interact with designers, how we work with um, stage management, how we interact with producers. Um, so if you have the opportunity and you want to see yourself as a director, dabble a little and, and be able to speak the language of your collaborators. And I think it will really help you. All right, great. Well, again, uh, on behalf of uh, the Hat Box, and Andrew, and uh, New World Theater, and myself, and just thank you guys for this. this has been a great two hours of uh, just kind of digging into uh, what uh, what it takes to take it from script and put it on stage. Uh, and very fascinating. Thanks, everybody. That was great. Hopefully, yeah, it was thanks to all of our attendees. Thanks to all of our panelists. Thanks to Donald. Uh, and uh, look forward to some up and coming ones. If you have any other thoughts or ideas for future uh, streaming roundtables or specific topics that you'd like to see uh, approached in this manner, please let us know because we're really interested in trying to uh, use this medium and this time productively in a way to kind of explore theater uh, more deeply while we have the time. So thank you everyone.